Ladies and gentlemen, we'll call the Cannabis Board Meeting, Compliance Board Meeting for June 20th, 2023. In order, first order of business is our roll call to make sure we have an official quorum. Member Merritt. Present. Member Durrett. Here. Dr. Young. Here. Member Guzman Fralick. Here. And Chair Douglas. Here. We have a quorum which then takes us to the first item on agenda, public comment. We'll start here in Las Vegas. When you come forward, please state your name for the record. Hello. Hello, my name is Will Adler. I'm here representing the Sierra Cannabis Coalition. Uh, we sent you guys uh, a written public comment earlier in a letter sort of composing our thoughts around uh, the continuation of my last public comment, the last CCB meeting was uh, the re-upping of a workshop around updating Nevada's cannabis testing laboratory regulations and sort of where we're at as a state. Uh, Washington State did this just recently, and I provided some material related to their update, the changes they made, and sort of the visual aids they actually provided to the public to show what they updated and why. Uh, I think much the same can be done here in Nevada. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's a state amount that would be the correct change or the update, but looking at the state's cannabis testing regulations, where they're at now, and just saying it's time to do an assessment of these and workshop them forward, I, I think is the right step at this time. So I'd ask any of the members to please uh, bring that forward for consideration the next CCB meeting. Thank you very much. And please uh, incorporate your thoughts in that letter and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment. Good morning, Chair and Board. Uh, for the record, my name is Bree Padilla, and I, while I currently serve and have the honor of serving as the Executive Director to the Chamber of Cannabis, it's been my absolute privilege to have had the opportunity to come before this body various times in many capacities as an advocate, as an industry professional, as a small business owner, and as a patient consumer. Here at that time, myself and my colleagues, some Chamber members and some not, have come to you to bring uh, to your attention not just a generalized need for change, but to point to specific codes, tools, and mechanisms through which we could achieve more clarity from this body as to how to best operate in accordance with our collective mandate as set forth in NRS 678.005. We acknowledge and appreciate all that the board and its staff have done by providing opportunities for input and dialogue, especially as it relates to revisions to NCCRs that directly impact the welfare and future of our industry. During the last meeting, there was an extended and thoughtful conversation about proposed changes to NCCR 5.020, 0 0.035, 0 0.042, 0 0.047, and 0 0.052. In addition to dialogue amongst the board, industry stakeholders also raised their own concerns about applying the lottery approach used with lounges to other future license types, and it was determined that a future workshop or conversation would be had. Given that NCCR 5.030 relates to the ability of the board to promulgate regulations on how a person who holds a license will apply for a license of the same or different type, we'd like to request that the board include the this NCCR in its future discussions of NCCR 5 prior to its repeal. I would also like to reiterate our willingness and capacity to participate in any workshops, working groups, or stakeholder meetings as it relates to any of the NCCRs discussed by our members today. Thank you, as always, for your time and for this forum. Thank you. Additional public comment, Las Vegas. Good morning, Amanda Connor from the law firm of Connor & Connor. I wanted to thank the board and uh, announce to everyone that my interns who recently graduated high school and are interested in the law are here today, and they have put a lot of time and effort and will be presenting our items on our behalf. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Additional public comment, Las Vegas this morning. 
Good morning. My name is Christina Ullman, C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-U-L-M-A-N. I'm the co-founder and the president of the Chamber of Cannabis, Nevada's largest business trade organization led by industry leaders and activists who collectively represent and advocate for the we. I come before you today excited and grateful for the progress that was made this legislative session to pass sensible cannabis policy that will evolve the Nevada cannabis industry, support the professionals who are building it, and the consumers and patients who are able to legally partake in its benefits. This session, cannabis business associations and stakeholders work tirelessly with lawmakers to get major legislation passed that will help such a broad range of employees and operators. From our cultivators to our bud tenders, bills like SB 277 will help save a struggling industry. We received feedback from a bud tender that said, as a dispensary employee, I benefit from SB 277 directly. My sales are capped by the legal limits. This will help both my sales bonus and my tips. And she's right. It will help her and thousands of other people. On behalf of all the members at the Chamber of Cannabis, we collectively and respectfully ask you to implement the changes to SB 277 as soon as possible so people like this young woman who reached out can make a better living and numerous other people can be positively affected by this change. We thank you for your understanding and as always, we offer our association as a resource for all things cannabis commerce, justice, and the community. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment, Las Vegas. Uh, good morning. For the record, my name is Abby Kaufman, A-B-B-Y-K-A-U-F-M-A-N-N. -N. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the board for posting the 10 NCCRs that were submitted for appeal that I requested at the last meeting. Uh, the Chamber of Cannabis appreciates the CCB's transparency and willingness to work with industry stakeholders in determining which regulations can uh, be streamlined to avoid unnecessarily inhibiting economic growth. So in addition to expressing my thanks, I'd like to provide comment on the five NCCRs that were listed as requiring additional public input. Uh, from my understanding, Senate Bill 195 largely addresses and revises the fee collection process in NCCR 6.025, which was listed as one of these five regulations requiring public input. And per Section 13 of SB 195, this bill becomes effective upon its passage, and therefore, as of June 13th, the CCB can no longer charge for the costs of certain ongoing activities of the board relating to the oversight of a cannabis establishment. So I think it goes without saying, but it's my hope that the CCB makes sure that um, any of the newly prohibited charges it may have issued in the last past days are reconciled. Um, but moving along, I'm pleased to see the CCB acknowledge the redundancy of the packaging and labeling requirements in our state with the other four NCCRs listed all pertaining to labeling. Uh, the posted document mentions that a workshop on labeling and packaging regulations will be conducted in June of 2023. So with just 10 days left in the month of June and given the fact that these regulations impact every part of the cannabis supply chain, I urge the CCB to provide us with at least 30 days notice of the proposed workshop and have the public notice include clear instructions for submitting input in advance of the workshop. Um, lastly, the posted document states that the labeling change is being sought to standardize the rounding of percentage points on labels. Uh, to clarify, Nevada's cannabis industry is seeking changes to the labeling and packaging regulations that go beyond the rounding of percentage points. Um, we are seeking changes that include the standardization of all labels and that minimize the amount of time and money involved in redundant labeling and packaging. Uh, changes that protect public safety by providing clarity and consistency. Changes that reduce the negative environmental impact and tremendous amount of waste that the current regulations necessitate. And with the passage of SB 277, we are also seeking revisions to NCCR 12.010 to account for the increased purchase limits. Uh, we are eager to work alongside the CCB to implement sensible changes to cannabis packaging and labeling in our state, and we look forward to discussing this further at the upcoming workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment, Las Vegas. Seeing none, public comment, Northern Nevada. Anything in Carson City this morning? Does not appear to be any public comment here today. And if we have anything on Zoom this morning. Sarah, do we have any callers on Zoom? Um, I'll check. For those online wishing to provide public comment, please click the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in via telephone, press star six on your keypad to raise your hand. 
there's no one wishing to provide public comment. With that, then we will close our public comment. We will move to item number two, meeting minutes consideration for approval of the May 23rd, 2023 Cannabis Compliance Board meeting minutes for possible action. And uh, if the board members have reviewed it, if we can have any additions or corrections and a possible motion for acceptance. Jerry Merritt, for the record, I move that we approve the minutes. We have a motion for approval of the minutes. Do we have a second? Ms. Member Young, I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded in discussion or, as I said, any corrections to be noted? Hearing none at this point, all in favor of the motion for approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? That matter passes. That goes to item number three, if we have all of our parties here. Uh, consideration of the proposed settlement agreement to resolve disciplinary action, Cannabis Compliance Board versus LNP LLC, case number 2023-018 for possible action this morning. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. L. Christopher Rath, Senior Deputy Attorney General. Uh, I'll be presenting the single settlement agreement we have up for approval today. And under agenda item 3A, we have the case of the CCB versus LNP LLC, CCB case number 2023-018. This licensee, LNP, is a medical and adult use cannabis cultivation facility. There was no complaint filed in this matter. Rather, after the investigation concluded, Respondents Council contacted me to discuss whether the matters at issue could be resolved via a settlement agreement uh, in lieu of a complaint. Parties were able to accomplish that, and so the respondent waived the filing and service of the complaint. The matter arises from an adult, or sorry, the matter arises from an audit investigation which, which commenced in June 2022. As set forth in paragraph two of the settlement agreement, CCB staff found multiple violations, primarily issues related to seed to sale tracking and inventory reconciliation issues, among others. The facility voluntarily shut down and worked with CCP staff to reconcile the inventory and destroy significant amounts of inventory that was not properly tracked. CCP agents accepted a final plan of correction in September 2022. Um, based on the uh, parties' negotiations, the uh, respondents agreed to resolve these matters, as noted in the settlement agreement, with an admission to one category three violation for failing to follow seed to sale tracking requirements and a second category three violation for failing to follow a required security plan. Respondent also agreed to pay civil penalties in the total amount of $40,000 with the option to make a lump sum payment or to pay over time in 10 monthly installments. The CCP staff and executive director fully considered the mitigating factors uh, in coming to this resolution. The mitigating factors are outlined in paragraph 12 of the settlement agreement. They included the fact that the facility voluntarily closed down temporarily to work on reconciling its inventory and voluntary, voluntarily destroyed a substantial amount of inventory and worked with the CCP staff to come up with a good plan of correction. Further, respondent and its counsel cooperated in resolving this matter without the need for the filing of a complaint. Without these mitigating factors, the CCB could have filed a complaint charging additional separate Category 3 violations and even a Category 2 violation for the lack of a security camera in one of the rooms containing cannabis. In addition, the CCB considered the ability to pay factor. The CCB has offered respondent the opportunity to pay the civil penalty over 10 months at $4,000 a month. Respondent also provided a plan of correction which is detailed in paragraph 21 of the settlement agreement, and the CCB has approved that plan. In summary, the plan of correction includes the inventory reconciliation previously discussed, the destruction of product uh, previously discussed, the placement of a security camera where one was missing, updates to standard operating procedures, staff training on waste disposal, and providing staff with additional metric training, as well as hiring a consultant to conduct staff training and compliance audits. 
based on the foregoing, the Attorney General respectfully requests and recommends the CCB, CCB approve the settlement agreement. I'm available for any questions, as is Ms. Ashcraft, counsel for respondent. Before we take any questions from the board members, from staff, I'd like to hear from uh, Ms. Ashcraft on behalf. Good morning. Thank you, Justice Douglas, board members, and Director Klimas. For the record, Alicia Ashcraft of the law firm of Armstrong Teasdale on behalf of LNP LLC with me. Also by way of Zoom today is Nicholas Lynch, manager of LNP LLC. Um, uh, Mr. Rath has more than adequately summarized the circumstances that brought forth the settlement today. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have and respectfully request approval of the stipulated settlement. Questions by the board and uh, hopefully the board, board members noted in the agreement, uh, the corrections that are being made by the licensee and most importantly, additional training of their staff uh, on some of the areas of concern, uh, the seed to sale tracking, um, security plans, things of that nature. But it's just, it's a good, good look for the licensee to take those things and we appreciate that. Um, Thank you so much. Comments or questions by board members. Member Durant for the record. Um, so the, the uh, factors that are to be considered under NCCR 4.030 subsection two. Well, first question. Okay, so uh, it's for the attorney general. It says that the executive director and council considered it, but under the reg, it also requires the board to consider it, right? But there are places, this is a bigger issue, where the board is interchangeable for board, for staff. Well, I think the board can consider it, which is, they're considering it as part of the settlement agreement. It's yeah. laid out in the settlement. Agreement. So you, yes. Okay. I, I kind of have like a bigger question that we'll deal with it. <laughs> we can deal with another day of when is board interchangeable for board agents? I think that's probably something that most agencies probably struggle with in, in you know, in ex not having exact language all the time, you know? So the factors are uh, pretty much already covered, but I wanted to ask you about the, what you thought about the economic benefit or savings and the last factor, the impact on the violator to continue in business. Thanks so much for the question, Member Durrett. Um, I, I think if uh, you take a look at the summary of what could have been charged in these circumstances, Mr. Rath can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it totaled somewhere around $190,000. Um, and uh, so in, in, in working with him and speaking with the licensee, settling upon 40, and also given the economic impact of the fact that they closed for such a long, for such a lengthy period of time, destroyed, um, I think just about all of their plants and had to, had to start from scratch. I think that that um, together with the payment plan that was offered, I, I think was uh, a fair settlement in this circumstance that, that um, but for the payment plan, I think that would have had a lot a greater economic impact, uh, but also in being able to settle and have some resolution now and avoid the cost of uh, an administrative hearing, um, that plus the reduction in the potential fines was, I think, thoughtfully considered in the circumstance. So the factor is economic benefit of committing the violations. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't need to go into that because I think you well, efficiently I, covered the last factor, which I yeah, think is I, the most important. I think that these were, uh, and I and you can look at the um, inspector's report and maybe Mr. Rath's analysis on your behalf. I think these were really, and, I, and prompting the justification for the settlement, really errors of omission rather than commission. I don't know that there was an academic economic benefits sought in what essentially 
amounts to kind of mismanagement of the inventory and, and tracking. Again, I think it was just the um, fact that folks were just headed down the wrong path, not maliciously or intentionally, but really just erroneously. And fortunately, um, this facility got started really when COVID hit. And so they didn't have a lot of access to seek answers to their questions in those early days of getting started, just because so many agencies were closed down. It was hard to get hold of people. The CCB was just getting started. Um, and so all of those factors just kind of led to a, a storm that unfortunately snowballed um, and wasn't caught until it was really just decimating to the facility overall. But it sounds like you the, the the business will survive if it pays this fine. Yeah, we're essentially starting from scratch. And and I think we can, um, not going to some wood, I think that they can, uh, and Mr. Lynch can speak to that as well, uh, with this fresh start moving forward, putting this behind them. And now with a new facility manager, um, with a stronger communication and relationship with uh, CCB inspectors and auditors, they're on the right path for sure. And I have another question for the attorney general, cause just because this is our only disciplinary case today. And I'm, I don't think that this applies today, but I'd like some guidance in the future on how we are going to apply it. Um, the new language under SB 328 that, um, that limits the grounds for disciplinary action to those who knowingly violate, uh, engage in gross negligence, unlawful or criminal conduct, or an act or omission that poses an imminent threat. I just would like to know going forward how we're going to filter through those that new language. Well, I mean, it contains the clause unlawful conduct, which would be violations of the regulations and statutes unlawful. So I think that's the key thing I see in this particular case. So you think that language doesn't change anything basically? I, not in this case, sir. Oh yeah, no, not in the, maybe not here, but I guess we'll have to discuss that going forward. Cause I don't think the legislature passes language that does nothing. They try not to. Well, I, I Certainly think, they I think it's something do. that was clarifying. So. Um, okay. Those my, those are my only questions. Thank you. Any other board member have a comment or concern or question? If not, uh, based upon what we have, uh, if if the board members are satisfied, if we can get a motion for approval of the settlement agreement. Member Dratt, I move to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Young. No, no, no that's okay, go ahead. Member Dratt, I move to approve the settlement agreement under agenda item 3A relating to LNP LLC. And this is Member Young, I'll second that. We have a motion, we have a second. Do we have any additional discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays, any abstention? None, the matter carries. I thank you and I thank the licensee for their cooperation. Thanks so much, and a special thank you to Mr. Rath for his professionalism and uh, consideration in settling this matter uh, for the licensee. Thanks so much. Thank you, Council. As a side comment before we go to our next item, just in terms of Member Durrett's comment, we will be sloshing through, so to speak, what the legislature has adopted and looking at the verbiage to see what... Uh, where we've been given specific guidance and where the guidance is kind of ambiguous. So it's going to be a, a fun little trick for a little bit as you're, as you put it out. With that, we have a request for transfers of interest, which is item number four. The first matter up is Desert Evolution LLC. We have TOIs 22011. D010, RD10, P009, 
RP009TO21C010RC010 for possible action today. If the representative could come forward on that. Good morning. Chair Douglas, Member Merritt, Member Durrett, Member Young, and Member Fraley. For the record, I'm David Staley, Division Chief of Investigations for the CCP. I'm here to present agenda item number four, which consists of one transfer of interest for TOI application and one request for CCR 5.0. Item A is a TOI application by Desert Evolution C. Desert. I'm, excuse me, Mr. Staley, this is the court reporter. You keep cutting out, so I don't know if you can maybe get closer to your microphone. I'll, I'll try a little closer. Is, is that okay? Yes, it sounds okay, but once you get going, it's just cutting out certain words. So we'll try it again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Desert Evolution holds cultivation, production, and dispensary licenses in Clark County, Nevada. TUI number 22011 was filed requesting approval for Ricardo Elias to sell his 9.9067 membership in Desert Evolution to existing men member Edgar Janata Jr. in order, in addition to the redistribution of membership from various existing majority members to James Hammer. Desert Evolution has also requested waivers of NCCR 5.110 pursuant to NCCR 5.112 and 5.125. If approved, the requirements for prior board approval of transfers of less than 5% of Desert Evolution's ownership and agent card requirements for owners of less than 5% will be waived. Desert Evolution has adequately addressed the items required in NCCR 5.112 and 5.125 to allow the board to approve such waivers. Staff suggests that if approved, the board limit Desert Evolution's 5.112 and 5.125 waivers to expire on its next TOI agenda date. As you're aware, recent changes pursuant to SB 277 may end up impacting the waiver process that we use. Uh, staff felt more comfortable keeping the waiver request on the agenda in an abundance of caution so that the company is best protected and that going forward, if uh, based on our analysis and new regulations, then we'll determine uh, if, if these regulations or if these waivers are required in the future. No areas of concern were identified during this investigative report. I am available for any questions and my understanding is that Melissa Wade, Brandon Kanitz, and Robert Slingerland are available to address any questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll return this item to you. If we can have the uh, various parties that are here on Zoom as well as in person identify themselves and anything you'd like to say to the board. Yes, thank you, Chief Staley. Good morning, Chair Douglas, Director Klimas, members of the board, Melissa Waite with the law firm of Dickinson Wright. Here today representing DEC Ops NV LLC, DEP Ops NV LLC, and DED. Ops NV LLC, all of which are wholly owned subsidiaries of Desert Evolution. Also present via Zoom is Brandon Knitz. Brandon is the owner, is an owner of Desert Evolution. He's the sole manager for DEC Ops and DEP Ops, and he sits on the board of managers for DED Ops. Also present via Zoom is Rob Slingerland. Rob is an owner of Desert Evolution and is also the point of contact for the licenses um, and handles. Um, local local operations currently. Um, we'd like to thank Chief Staley and Investigator Monique Pedden for the, and, and staff for their hard work and attention to this transfer of interest. And we would request approval of this TOI. And of course, we're here to answer any questions the board may have. Very interesting. Uh, I'll call it a family tree or structure. It is. Uh, Large <laughs> family tree. But having said that, uh, board members, do you have any uh, questions? Either the licensee or staff you wish to add, uh, there'd be no, uh, there's no major areas of concern or areas of concern in general. Uh, Member Dret, for the record, how do you keep track of all those LLCs? And <laughs> this one is particularly challenging. One of the most challenging we have because they're not a public company. And so we have to be very meticulous in how we manage all of the owners, even those owners under 5%. So it's it's a pretty administrative, intensive process. Is there, who's who's in charge of that? 
so we work very, I work very closely with Rob Slingerland. He has been involved since the beginning when these licenses were acquired from CW Nevada. Um, and a lot of that is some of the CW Nevada resolution and, and um, result resulted in this little complicated cap table. Um, and so he's managed that and we work very closely on almost a weekly basis, um, making sure that we're in tune on everything that's that's there and changes and issues. And um, so they've done a really good job of keeping up with everything. And uh, could I hear just like one or two sentence background? Um, I got to meet Robert one time, but I'd love to hear more about what you were up to before this. And uh, same with Brandon. So Rob, do you want to go first? Give us a little background about your prior experience and, and role here. I will do so. Hello, board and staff. Thank you for taking the time and, cons and consideration. Uh, Rob Slingerland here. I have been a uh, prior business executive, both in CFO and CEO, role, CEO roles in a number of industries previous to the cannabis, including uh, a number of years in the insurance business, which uh, may be the only uh, industry that's more regulated than cannabis, or at least uh, at least close, and bring you know, that experience and background to, to this role. Prior to uh, joining uh, with uh, Brandon and uh, the, the team there, I was head of business development and business affairs for a company that I call Candescent, which is a uh, premium brand cannabis operator in, in California. And then I work closely with Brandon and the team throughout the uh, CW Nevada uh, receivership mess. Uh, to help guide that through is to, you know, be able to get the company out and launched, successfully launched and into where, where it is today. And then Brandon, you want to share a little bit as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Brandon Knitz. Uh, my background is uh, primarily in finance. Uh, my specialty is in small community banks. So I acted as a market maker for small community banks, as well as an investment banker. Uh, I've been on the board of troubled banks, gone through the non-objection process through the FRB, and uh, and then hooked up with Edgar D. Janata, um, myself and my partner Genesis, who's involved, uh, managed the family office, the Janata family. We've been investing in cannabis since 2015. We've raised and deployed almost a quarter billion dollars into the space. Um, and I'm currently the CEO of both Desert Evolution and a large uh, vertically inter integrated operation in, in Michigan. So that's my background. Member Durrett, you have any other questions? Is no, I'm glad I asked because that was really interesting. Um, wait, I did have one more question. Um, oh, I just, I see the Hammers are also involved and I would said this at a previous meeting, but I know they've been involved since the beginning, since the early medical days, since before businesses even opened and they've always been really involved in how cannabis policy would be shaped going forward and, and helping rescue the industry when it had some major pitfalls in the in the early days. Yes. And and actually Jim Hammer Sr. and James Hammer Jr. are both involved um, in, in the operations here on the dispensary side. So very lucky to have their experience in the group. Thank you. With that, uh, if the board is satisfied, if we can get a, a motion for approval with the waiver conditions. Member Dredd, I move to approve the requested transfer of interest under agenda item 4A. Um, that would be a condition upon, or, I'm sorry, in addition, the requested waivers would be approved. The waivers of the requirements under NCCR 5.110 pursuant to NCCR 5.112 and 5.125, those would be set to expire on the next agenda date that um, the subject licensee requested another transfer. With that, we have. Do we have a second? Member Merritt, I was second. I moved and seconded. Any additional questions or uh, concerns? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? None. Matter carries. We thank the licensee.
and we especially thank the uh, council for uh, getting us through this very easily. Very, very good. Thank you all. Takes us to item B under four MA and Associates LLC L002 RL002 Addendum to TOI 21022 and 22004 Request for Waiver of NCCR 5.110 Pursuant to NCR 5.112 for possible action. Do we have licensee or counsel present today on that? Chair Douglas, members of the board, for the record, I'm David Staley, Chief of Investigations. Item B is an addendum to TOI applications 21022 and 220041 by MA and Associates LLC. TOIs number 21022 and 220041 were heard at the March 2023 board meeting, and the board approved the transfer of 95% of MA and Associates membership to Mark Sarnik. However, a waiver of NCCR related to transfers of ownership of less than 5% were not presented to the board at that time. This also will, uh, our review of SB 277 will uh, dictate any changes in the future. In this addendum, MA and Associates is requesting a waiver of NCCR 5.110 pursuant to 5.12. MA and Associates has adequately addressed the items required in NCCR 5.12 to allow the board to approve such waiver. Staff suggests that if approved, the board limit MA and Associates 5.112 waivers waiver to expire on its next TOI agenda date. No areas of concern were identified during the investigation into this NCCR 5.0 waiver. I am available for any questions, and my understanding is that Amanda Connor is available to address any questions you have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. Thank you. And on behalf of the licensee. Good morning, Amanda Connor. On behalf of MA and Associates LLC, we kindly request approval of this waiver, and I'm available for any questions. Questions by the board? This primarily is on just as a cleanup matter. That's correct. Um, with the original transfer, the waiver was not presented to the board, so we're coming here to clean that up. Thank you. If we have no questions by the board, which well, is possible, uh, <laughs> do we have a motion? Member Dredd, I move to approve the, requaver, the, the, the request for the waiver uh, of NCCR 5.110 pursuant to 5.112, which would be set to expire on the next TOI agenda date. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I, I second. second. We have dueling seconds. Uh, with that, do we have any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. We have no opposed, correct? And no abstentions. Matter carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. That moves us to item five, which gets us into beginning of new grounds and things that are going forward. Consideration of approval for conditional license for cannabis consumption lounge. The first item up is item A, Planet 13 Holding Inc. for possible action. For the record, Leighton Kohler, General Counsel of MM Development Company, DBA Planet 13, a subsidiary of Planet 13 Holdings Inc. Leighton, can I, can I read it into the record first? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chief Staley. Jumping in, I'm psyched. I know this is, we're all very excited. Thank you. It's Chair hard, Douglas. Members hard to control board. some people. <laughs> for, Sorry. for the record, I'm uh, David Staley, Chief of Investigations. I'm here to present agenda item number five, which consists of three requests for approval of a conditional license for a cannabis consumption lounge. These retail attached applicants are the first three cannabis consumption lounge applicants to appear before you for approval of a conditional licensure. 
If the board approves the conditional licensure, these entities will still need to complete necessary local approvals and a final inspection by the CCB's inspection and audit division before they can open for business. Item A is a request for approval from Planet 13's Planet 13 Holdings, Inc. Planet 13 received an early suitability review by this board at its August 2022 board meeting. Planet 13 has submitted all the documentation necessary to receive its conditional cannabis consumption lounge license and plans to open such lounge in its Las Vegas Superstore location. No areas of concern were identified during this investigation. I am available for any questions, and my understanding is that Leighton Kohler, Larry Schleffler, and Robert Grosbeck are available to address any questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. Thank you. And, and my apologies, I did not uh, let uh, Larry Scheffler and Bob Grusbeck know to be here today, so please accept me uh, here on their behalf. And oh, wait, I guess I should have asked, Chief Staley, can I go now? I Make sure I... Please. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm here for your approval for our conditional lounge license application for MM Development Company. Um, at this current stage, we're still finalizing our SUP application. So some of the uh, application is in the conceptual level, but uh, we've locked in the concepts of the operations, the, the training, the safety programs, and all our, our key areas of focus and, and what we also believe would be you know, the most compliant approach at this early phase. Some of our, um, our building plans are still being finalized because we were looking to what the CCB would do with Regulation 15 and some of the air handling and um, that could cause a move within our facility where we ultimately place the, the lounge. But that wouldn't change any of what is before you here today in our conditional application. Um, I, I definitely wanted to take the time to thank staff. There was some back and forth and discussions, um, some education from them as to what their expectations were. I appreciate that, that very much helps us as licensees. Um, I also wanted to take a moment in front of this board and thank my staff who, as we go through questions, if there's something I don't know, they will know. We, we drafted this application in-house. We wanted to take the time to think about every step of the process internally at Planet 13. Um, so with that concept that uh, I don't have anything concrete other than generic plans, operations manuals, and safety programs that we will implement, as well as a diversity plan that we are already engaged in and operating under currently. Um, I'd like to take any questions and then ask for your approval. I know that for all, all three licensees on today, the air handling is a, a major concern um, and economic concern as well. Uh, the other question though is, are the, the local ordinances in place or finalized that affect your location? They are uh, primarily developed. We were waiting on Clark County until recently to finish the zoning requirements, and that uh, that's in now. Um, and I, I believe Clark County did an excellent job. You know, we're an unincorporated Clark. I've seen some other SUPs going through in other jurisdictions. So those are, those are rolling out. Um, uh, there was a very strong focus on traffic safety uh, with Clark County, and, and that was very appreciated because we as well are very focused on that. So still still going through that process. I think our application is going to go in basically uh, the week after whatever happens here. Uh, questions by other board, board members? I think this is more for Chief Staley. So my understanding is this is kind of a, a checklist. It's a must. It's not something where we have discretion. We're not weighing what they've provided us. Uh, Member Merritt and David Staley, for the record. Yeah, I think the, the statutes and regulations uh, require that they must be submitted. Um, I, I don't think it requires that uh, we determine that their efficacy is, is appropriate. However, in all of the applications in front of you today, it's clear that the applicants have spent quite a bit of time putting these policies and procedures in place. So they well beyond simply meeting the requirements of the uh, of the statutes and regs have taken a very thoughtful approach to how they'll be opening these things in the future. And then keep in mind, uh, we get closer to their being open for business, our audit inspection groups will be going out final on the ground inspection of the operations. Um, but yes, from a strict regulatory perspective, uh, they have met all the requirements. 
Um, although uh, in the materials before you, you'll see the amount of work and effort that, that they're taking in putting these in place. Thank you. And um, the final inspection, so we'll just be notified once that happens. They won't be, will they possibly be open before they're back on the agenda notifying us of the final inspection? Or will it be on the agenda first before they actually open the doors? Uh, Member Mayor David Staley, for the record. I don't know for sure that we have determined that yet. Uh, sure, Tyler Klein is for the record. So Member Durrett, um, similar to the agenda item, we have agenda item number seven. Uh, the next time you'll see likely Planet 13 come back onto the agenda for their consumption lounge will be potentially after they've already opened. It'll be an informational item. Staff here will have approved them to open. And if the timing works, they may have opened before the next board meeting. So you'll get it as an informational item, similar to how um, agenda items 7A, 1, and 2 exist on, on the agenda today. Okay, thank you. Thanks for noting that all the additional, or that they had kind of, that they've done a good job because I would like to see that other uh, proposals, maybe they could, um, you know, follow suit. Thanks. I, th I think, Chair Douglas, I think additionally, uh, Member Durrett, that we will uh, see the race to be who's going to be first for purposes of being on all the channels and new services and paper be notified of pre opening and opening celebrations. So, a little history for. The state. Member Dret, for the record, yeah, I'm surprised the press isn't here now. I'm thinking maybe it just didn't sound excited, it didn't sound like an opening, but congratulations. With that having Chairman, been said, have do we have a motion for approval unless we have any other questions or uh, I have Member Fraley. I have a question. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't have the benefit of having been here to, to hear the ideas of what this would look like and and for my benefit perhaps the benefit of others who are sit in the same position as me i wonder if you can just kind of give me uh uh without uh disclosing any of any of your um uh coveted information you know so that you have the edge on everybody else could you just kind of give me an idea of what your lounge looks like or what 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 this um what this is gonna be like imagine heaven but better <laughs> <laughs> wow okay all right so, sorry sorry uh <laughs> member Frey, like on a more serious note um we really are in a conceptual phase at this point and um there's there's three different tiers of possibilities what we're looking at and uh that's anywhere from a a modest sized um tasting lounge experience to a, uh, we've got a restaurant uh, facility within our facility that we could convert. And then also all the way up to an Uber lounge, uh, nightclub cannabis concept. And those are various tiers based on the, the, the return on the investment basically is it's a strict business pencil out the math. And we're still looking at that because we're still trying to decide how much it costs to implement. So I, I know that's very unspecific, but that's the truth of where we're at right now. This Thank just occurred to me, Member Dret. Um, oh, sorry. W what portions of your pl plans are public since you're a publicly traded company? Is it all of it or what's required to be submitted? Um, as a public company, if I have material information or contracts, we disclose that as a public company to investors and to the markets at large. Um, to uh, uh, confidential filings with the board, uh, when we file in our, our final application for the final inspection, it will have everything. So uh, like, you know, like floor plans, I wouldn't want that out in the world as a public filing because there's security implications. If someone wanted to attack a facility, having access to those floor plans, knowing ca uh, where cameras are located, where security patrols, we wouldn't want that out in the world. So we're, we try to be careful from that perspective. Thanks. Any other questions? <clears throat> if we have no other questions of either staff or the licensee, we have a motion. Please. This is Member Guzman Freilich. I'd like to make the motion to approve uh, the conditional license 
for a cannabis consumption lounge for the applicant. We have a motion for approval as a routine holding as to a conditional license for cannabis consumption lounge. Do we have a second? This is Member Young, I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Do we have any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays, any abstentions? Matter carries and passes. Good luck and we'll look forward to the opening. Thank you for your time. That moves us to of common sense. Botanicals, Nevada. Item B. Good morning. Chair Douglas, members of the board, David Staley for the record. Item B is a request for approval from the venue at Soul Cannabis LLC, a subsidiary of Common Sense Botanicals Nevada LLC. Common Sense Botanicals received an early suitability review by this board at its December 2022 board meeting. The venue at Seoul has submitted all the documentation needed to receive its conditional cannabis consumption lounge license and plans to open such lounge in Common Sense Botanicals existing dispensary in Washoe Valley. No areas of concern were identified during this investigation. I am available for any questions, and my understanding is that Edward Alexander is available to address any questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. Mr. Alexander? Good morning, Chairman Douglas, uh, Director Klimas, and the rest of the board. I wanted to uh, thank you guys. I uh, really want to spend some time commenting that Chief Staley's staff has been exemplary through the entire process. We had lots of questions. They had lots of questions. And, and it's so refreshing that we get to have open dialogue. Uh, Jeff Justice, who we work with, is a phenomenal individual. And, and while we still have a lot of questions. Um, I'm excited about this new opportunity. I'm, I'm also hoping that through opportunities like presenting themselves this afternoon with the air quality workshop and some other things moving forward that, that collectively we can move this new aspect of the industry forward because as Planet 13 alluded to, you know, there's still a lot of questions as to the financial viability of this, safety concerns, what it looks like, what it feels like. And, and as the only licensee in Northern Nevada, um, you know, we want to make sure that we get it correct. We want to make sure that, that the CCB and the rest of the industry, <clears throat> local jurisdictions understand that this may or may not be a revenue center for the industry but it's definitely an opportunity to continue pushing one of the largest industries in Nevada forward in a very sensible and, and responsible way. Um, I'm available for any questions. And, and uh, while my thunder was stole that our place was just like heaven, you know, we're, 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 <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking at a, a much different concept, I think, than P13. With that having been said, um, <clears throat> You're in Northern Nevada. We had Southern Nevada. Um, have the local ordinances been put in all four squares? Or are they still uh, hanging up? Well, I had to postpone a meeting that was duly scheduled for today to help Washoe County work through some things. And, and I'll be quite honest with you, there, there is a need for this board to take some I'll say action or, or nudging of both local jurisdictions in the South and in the North, because, because you guys live cannabis on a daily basis. Washoe County, for example, experiences it from the fringe. And, and so this is uncharted. It's, it's scary that they, they're, I don't, you know, concerned for lack of a better description about what it looks like. You know, we've tried to express that, Cannabis will complement the experience in a lounge. It may not be the experience in a lounge. And I think that there's a, 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 a varied understanding of what this may look like. And, and, and if we get it wrong as an industry, it's going to be very difficult to unwind that clock. So, so again, I commend you guys for the air quality work that's going forward. 
I've got a lot of questions in terms of tax structure and various financial implications as, as it relates to our, our relationship with the CCB and, and ultimately making sure that regulated facilities aren't at, at such a disadvantage. Uh, you know, respectfully, guys, I got into town last night. I had dinner. I look over in the corner at the place I'm having dinner at. Oh, by the way, there's some folks at a nightclub in enjoying the benefits and features of, of cannabis in Las Vegas. Uh, oh, they didn't stroke a check for a hundred grand. They didn't just spend, you know, nine months going through, you know, a very rigorous process. And so, you know, there's, I, I think everybody here would agree that, you know, this, this may or may not be all it's cracked up to be. And we out, we owe it to this industry to make sure that, that, that collectively we get it right. I can appreciate that. Um, maybe the the brethren and sisters down south who at least one of the jurisdictions has passed some ordinances that might be helpful, not unnecessary, that they have to follow those strictly, but give them some ideas as to going forward. Uh, Member Freilich from the north asked a question as to Planet 13 without giving secrets away, kind of a general of what your uh, lounge might look like or be like? Well, there's been a few of you that have, have come to my facility. You know, we, we took a completely separate approach than anybody else in the, in the state of Nevada. We're a vertically integrated, co-located facility. We've got a 25,000 square foot greenhouse. And when you walk into our 10,000 square foot dispensary, you're met by floor to ceiling glass looking into the viewing room. Um, we sit on 17 acres of land. We've got a 7,000 square foot deck. We anticipate this being a entertainment based complex where cannabis complements the experience. I anticipate food being a component. Um, and, and more so than anything, I think something that's important to recognize is right now, you know, we invite people to Disneyland and then we don't let them ride the rides. Um, you know, we, we, we have, uh, a, a, you know, every, every weekend during the summer, we do music at our, at our facility. And every weekend, the old grouchy tattooed hippies out there saying, Hey guys, I know that you're at Disneyland, but you can't ride the rides. So, and what I mean by that is, you know, hey, it's, it, we, you know, we jeopardize our licenses if somebody consumes on, on site. Um, you know, that, that's a big ask of someone, you know, um, and, and so from our standpoint, we, we, we look for, we, we look to building a place where community can come together around the commonality of cannabis and, and, and where it is enhancing the experience, but is not the experience in and of its entirety. So, you know, not unlike some of the vineyards that, that exist in Napa, you know, hey, you go, you listen to some entertainment, there's a tasting room, you know, there's opportunities for folks to experience all that this great industry has to offer in a controlled environment. So, you know, again, I'll just ask that we softly and gently walk down this path together because, you know, the air quality issue is a, is a prime example of something that if left in as it currently existed, nobody was opening. Because we just physically can't afford to, 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 to make this thing happen uh, when, when no other, you know, nightclubs in Vegas are subject to the same, or Nevada for that matter, are subject to the same scrutiny. So, you know, regulate like alcohol, I think is how we pass this thing. And, and we, would, we would love to be treated in a similar regulatory fashion. Thank you. Other board members have uh, questions? Member Dratt, I have um, some questions. Um, I think those are very valuable comments. Thank you for making them because I think sometimes, you know, we have to make the decisions in a bubble when people are not participating um, at, at a level that we need them to. So I think those are very helpful comments, um, especially about the economics of this, whether it's actually going to work. I, uh, I read a, a Okay, I skimmed a book recently by some economists that were questioning is it, will legal weed win? Um, because even though there's like 30 billion in sales throughout the country, 
that the economics may not pan out. We're still waiting for it 10 years later to find out overall, is this how, uh, when there's so much money going back out the door, how are these businesses going to be successful? So I think that's really helpful to bring up. Um, I, you know, of course the board is somewhat limited by the statutes, but, um, and I think this board has been very accepting of, of, opening up consumption lounges as much as we're able to do. But you're right, we have to be very conscientious about not over-regulating. I, um, I took my kids to a pool, I took them to the Golden Nugget pool over the weekend. At the pool and then walking to our car, the odor of cannabis was so strong that I was worried, and I don't care about the odor, but I was, so sh- I was worried that they were gonna smell like it later. Like we are in very public locations. This is not, uh, it's, it's going to, they're going to smell like they got hot boxed, my little kids. So, so we need to be aware of all the other opportunities there are for people to smoke publicly or consume publicly. Um, I have a couple questions. So when I had originally toured your facility, you were planning on doing outdoor concert venues. Are you still planning yeah, we. I uh, I wish that uh, I had the ability to uh, snap my fingers and show you, uh, you know, our site. But currently, we've got the uh, forty-five thousand square feet of landscape space, raised stage. Uh, you know, this Sunday we've got a band coming in from Portland. So, so you know, we we've been doing entertainment. Uh, you know, we finalized our initial phase of of our entertainment complex three days before we got shut down for for covid uh um but but at the end of the day yes our the the vision again is you can have the transaction of cannabis in 23 or 24 states now you can you can you can buy it at 7-eleven in many instances uh but but you can't have the experience and you know northern nevada and in southern nevada the draw is the experiential component. You know, Las Vegas has built itself on the experience of Vegas. We need to make sure that we have the ability to add this to that that uh, resume. One, I think a lot of people have questioned the economics of lounges. So I think if it turns out they don't work, I mean, it, it, it it's not, you know, this, this it's not necessarily the state's doing. It's that we're not sure if these are going to be economically viable or not? Well, well, I'll give you an example of, of a question that I raised. And, and again, respectfully, I don't expect you guys to have all the answers. You know, I've, I've tiny background, you know, a, I was the original chairperson of the ILAC committee. So, so we drafted all of the regulations or, or assisted in drafting regulations as it related to the medical program pre-launch. This needs to be handled in a very similar fashion. And, 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 So as it currently exists, lounges are going to acquire cannabis from existing dispensaries. So when I asked staff, okay, do I, as the lounge, pay the 10% retail burden or do is is this like a traditional business where there's a resale license per se in place and then the end consumer pays that 10% very respectfully, I got to, we hadn't thought about that. There's a lot of those types of implications in which when we start looking, and there's been some progress made, tremendous progress in the legislative session to, to, I'll say, correct some taxation challenges that we've been dealing with. But at the end of the day, on a granular level, now we've got an additional licensing fee. Now we've got an ad- potentially an additional tax burden. I don't know if the local jurisdictions down here are looking at, oh, it's 3% transacted from, from dispensary to lounge and another 3% transacted because pretty soon to make it financially viable, somebody acquires a $10 pre-roll at the dispensary. And a $30 pre-roll to have the experience of consuming it at a place very similar to a nightclub that they can consume it for free at this point. So, Mm -hmm. again, we have have to be very mindful of of looking at an opportunity for industry growth versus 
a collective cash grab. Um, because if, if, if we get the order of operation incorrectly, right? I, I was always taught, if you do it correctly, the money will follow. We have to, as collectively, we got to look at it that way. It's like, guys, let's get it right. And, 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 and it, whatever it is financially, will trickle down. It's jobs. It's, it's, it's helping prop up an industry that, to be quite frank right now, you know, to, to your earlier point, there's, a, there's more question marks about where this thing's at in five years than there are answers right now. And, and we've, we're, we're in uncharted territory in many different uh, areas. I just, one last thing. Um, I think that the, the, those with consumption lounges need to be more cohesive and, and, um, and participate more. We did have, you know, a lot of workshops on this and, and it sounds like there's a lot more to do going forward. So I think if they were meeting with each other, coming up with collective recommendations, those with consumption lounges, it would be really helpful to provide, um, you know, one voice to the, to the state on what, on recommendations. I, I don't disagree with you a bit. I think one of the ways that we were very, very successful in the medical days about getting that done was through things like ILAC, that, that there should be a subcommittee, if you will, on lounges that gives both licensees, local jurisdictions, the general public an opportunity for, for input moving forward because again early on we both you know it, it, it was a mutually accepted fact that you guys didn't have it figured out and we didn't have it figured out so collectively we moved through it together to get to where we are now as an industry we got to look at this the same way you know in my opinion Are there questions from board members? Questions from the North, our Northern board members? If we have no additional questions at this time, uh, do we have a motion? Member Dret, I move to approve the um, conditional license for the Cannabis Consumption Lounge under agenda item 5B relating to common sense botanicals. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Member Merritt, I have a second. It's been moved and seconded. For a motion for approval. Any additional discussion or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the conditional license licensing, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? Hearing on the matter passes. Thank you very much. And Thank you. We'll look forward to it going forward. That takes us to item number C under this, Cheyenne Medical, Sammy Davis. Chair Douglas, members of the board, I'm David Staley, Chief of Investigations for the record. Item C is a request for approval from Cheyenne Medical, Sammy Davis, RD263 LLC. Cheyenne received an early suitability re review by this board at its September 2022 board meeting. Cheyenne has submitted all the documentation needed to receive its conditional cannabis consumption lounge license and plans to open such lounge to its existing dispensary in Las Vegas. No areas of concern were identified during this investigation. I am available for any questions, and my understanding is that Amanda Condor and Mitchell Britton are available to address any questions you may have as well. With that, Chair Douglas, I'll turn this item back to you. With that, we have our, our licensee. Um, and uh, as Attorney Connor indicated, we have some special guests to make a presentation uh, under her tutelage this morning. Uh, and this one is, uh, has the smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Good morning, members of the board. Lauren Buden with Connor & Connor for the record. Mitch Britton, who's a member and manager of CPCM Holdings. 
the owner of Cheyenne Medical is also in attendance. We are requesting approval for a consumption lounge application for Cheyenne Medical, Sammy Davis, RD263 LLC as a retail attached lounge. Cheyenne Medical is both competent and experienced for maintaining a consumption lounge due to its successes in other cannabis establishments. As you may be aware, they currently compliantly operate six cannabis retail stores in Nevada. I am Jake Wampagir for the record. All members and owners of Cheyenne Medical LLC are reputable and knowledgeable through their experiences in the cannabis industry. They have maintained compliance with the board and familiarized themselves with Nevada's cannabis regulations, which has led them to sustain and successful establishments. Since compliance is a large focus of Cheyenne Medical's operations, we believe that if granted, Cheyenne Medical's consumption lounge will be a positive addition to the cannabis market. Sydney Yee, for the record. Additionally, we believe that Cheyenne Medical's deep understanding of the cannabis industry and consumer trends will lead to successful consumption establishment, as well as serve a model for future consumption lounge establishments. We thank you for your consideration and request approval on this matter. Amanda Connor and Mitch Britton are available for any questions you may have. Thank you. And special thanks to Connor, for the tutelage uh, and questions of counsel. Uh, your your location is also in Clark County, so and not the city. Correct. This location is an unincorporated Clark County. So we have local regulation somewhat in place at this time. That's correct. Amanda Connor, for the record, um, Clark County has passed its zoning ordinance, um, and uh, so their regulations are are in place. And subject to the ventilation, which we'll get into later, which will affect the licensee. Uh, just a kind of overall concept of what type of experience you're hoping to create without giving your secrets away. Sure. Uh, Mitch Britton, for the record. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've designed this space to be very um, kind of fluid. So we uh, had this built into our designs back when we initially built built out the dispensary. So we knew that there was going to be a lot of adaption that needed to take place, um, you know, as these uh, as these regs started to fall, uh, fall out. So um, we've got roughly 3,000 square feet total um, of indoor space. We've also uh, applied with outdoor consumption as uh, as part of the local land use approval. Um, and so we're, we're kind of really willing to kind of back into any, any way this thing needs to look. Who gets the credit for the name Smoke and Mirrors? Not people a lot smarter than me. <laughs> yeah. Questions by other board members. <clears throat> this is Member Guzman Frey. Like same question to you as far as uh, what what the, your concept is. What what level of heaven? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think we we need to thank Leighton. That one but um i think for us it's it's really um something that's meant to be approachable that's what we we sought to do with our brand from the very beginning was make something that was comfortable for um somebody coming into our store in their 80s 90s and somebody that's 21 years old so um we've kind of followed that into the lounge as well to make it someplace that feels safe inviting welcoming um and and that's really what you'll see there um you know kind of following after cigar lounges and things like that Thank you. Uh, member Durrett, for the record, um, that discussion that we just had on the record and with the last licensee, do you have any thoughts about that? Anything to add about what you think the industry will need going forward? Yeah, I, I mean, I think industry wide, um, you know, we're, we're definitely competing not only amongst uh, everybody in this room, but a very strong and robust black market. Um, and I think everything that we are doing on a daily basis is is trying to find ways to, to combat that. And I know the board is starting to look at, at options or hopefully starting to look at options. Um, so I think all the all the points that were raised earlier were, were very valid. Um, I think taxation is something that um, we always have to worry about double dipping and making it so, to the point where it's not approachable anymore and kind of re further reinforces people going to the black market. Um, I think we already see that on a daily basis. So um, I think any any work and any progress we have on this is going to be great for everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? If not, can we have a motion for approval, the conditional approval? 
um, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is uh, Member Guzman Frey. Like, just really quick before we make the motion, I just wanted to um, uh, give a shout out to the um, interns. I think they give us lawyers a run for their money. <laughs> With that, we're back to, do we have a motion? <laughs> <laughs> this is Member Young. I'll, I'll move that we approve agenda item 5C, the conditional license for cannabis consumption lounge for Cheyenne Medical, Sammy Davis. I'll second that. We have a motion. We have a second for the conditional licensing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays, any abstentions? Matter carries. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank the interns for their presentation. Yes, and thank you. And I'd like to thank Chief Investigator Staley and his staff. This suitability investigation process went very smoothly. Thank you. This takes us to item number six, consideration of proposed adoption amendments and or repeal of Nevada Cannabis Compliance Regulations, specifically NCCR 15.055, ventilation of cannabis consumption allowances for possible action. Um, kind of overview before we take public comment as to this item. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. For the record, my name is Michael Miles, Deputy Director of the CCB. This agenda item is to bring forward potential changes to NCCR 15.055. As noted, 15.055 is the air quality and ventilation requirements for licensed consumption lounges as required by NRS 678B.650, Section 11A, and 678D.455, Section 1A. The original version made it through multiple workshops uh, without revision or even real comment during the creation of the cannabis consumption lounge regulations. However, we understand that the potential licensees likely hadn't researched the construction of said systems when these regs were approved. The board received a few suggestions from various stakeholders regarding modification to these ventilation regs. We asked those stakeholders to come up with a proposed change to NCCR 15.055 that they all could agree to. Those stakeholders included Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Sala Consulting, Nevada Cannabis Association, and Strategies 360. The, that version is before you today. The main changes are replacing the HEPA filter with a MERV 14 filter, adding a portable device that maintains the same air quality standards, also a different way of venting the air. Um, Chris Anderson of Sala Consulting is here to discuss and answer any questions the board may have if any, regarding the changes and that he has brought an engineer with him uh, that he consulted with. And staff is in support of these changes. Thank you, Chair. Having said that, uh, if we can have individuals who wish to make statements for or against or possible changes as to what's being proposed today, uh, come forward, please state your name and uh, we'll hear what you have to say. Chris Anderson with Sala Consulting on behalf of Planet 13 Holdings. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Douglas, uh, Director Klimas, uh, members of the board. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to come and speak to some changes. Um, you're correct, Deputy Director Miles, that you know when uh, consumption lounges were first kind of envisioned and we, uh, when the, this body passed um, its first version of regulations to govern uh, these new concepts, uh, we maybe didn't dig down as, as deeply as we could have on uh, this uh, issue of ventilation in, in particular. Um, now having the benefit of a little bit of uh, work and kind of knowing what it takes to bring uh, these systems online, I think we have a much better, uh, I think we have a helpful revision. Um, speaking to uh, uh, subsections one through four, um, again, uh, as I stated at the last uh, workshop on NCCR 15.055, uh, speaking to subsections one through four, you know, we and um, our engineer who's uh, in attendance with us today 
uh, Dr. Dennis Landsberg from uh, LNS uh, Energy Consulting. Um, we believe that uh, subsections one through four uh, meaningfully lower the barrier to entry for consumption lounge operators in uh, drastically reducing the upfront investment and ongoing operational and uh, energy uh, costs of running these uh, ventilation systems without uh, meaningfully deteriorating air quality. So I'll, I'll invite uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Dennis Landsberg, um, up here with me to answer any questions you might have specifically about subsections one through four. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dennis Landsberg, and I'm here to answer any questions you have. Our concept was to meet the performance standards of your regulation without deteriorating the air quality. While so we're trying to maintain the same air quality at a lower cost. I'm a licensed design professional. I've been licensed for 47 years, and I've I do a lot of work for ANC ASHRAE national standards. So I'm familiar with standards of language and how to write standards. And I've also done a lot of work on industrial, medical, and classified buildings where if you don't control contaminants, people can be injured or die. And we used the same sort of a philosophy that we use in those buildings. Any comment in terms of trying to balance the economics and the wish or state legislature in wanting air quality standards for challenges? We are going to maintain the air quality standards that you want. But the most important component, I believe, is pressure control. If the lounge is under a negative pressure compared to the ancillary spaces, the smoke is not going to leave the lounge. If you open the door, the draft is going to be into the lounge. And the ancillary spaces are going to be negative in comparison to the outside environment. And so the same thing. So we're not trying to degrade the environment at all. We're uh, uh, basically, Pressurization is a way to control the smoke. Ventilation is a way to dilute it, and filtration is a way to eliminate it. And we're using all three strategies. We're just using a more cost-effective method of doing it. Board members with questions? I know it's a little, little different public comment, but nonetheless, questions. Uh, if there's no questions of the speaker, then thank you very much. Thank you. And in closing, uh, Chris Anderson for the record, Ian. And in closing, uh, Solid Consulting and uh, Planet 13 Holdings uh, support the uh, regulatory revisions that are before you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Christopher Laporte for the record with Reset. Um, one approach is from... Uh, layman's terms play. Um, right now, a chemical factory has an OSHA standard of six minimum air changes per hour. We are at 15 for a, can a cannabis consumption lounge. Uh, we have been working with several organizations as well to find other solutions outside of the rudimentary change the air every two minutes because of the cost effectiveness of that. And CFM is something that I am not an expert on, but there was some documents submitted from Airbox, which is a technology that can scrub the air before pushing it out. So as simple as I can make it versus a maximum 15, I'm sorry, every two minutes changing the air, I recommend a minimum of five, perhaps six, and something to go to make this process easy. Any questions? No questions. Thank you at this time. Thank you. This is Member Young. I, I guess I have a question, but I don't, I'm not really sure who I'd address this to. Does anybody know what the current standards are for uh, from the regulation for the building of buildings? What What is the ventilation requirement 
for a non-cannabis building. I, I believe that Alexander, for the record, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's one air exchange per hour. Board Member Young, uh, the, the reason we, we came up with the, the 30 refreshes per hour based on um, cigar lounge standards that we researched. Remember, Dr. for the record, is that um, they were at 30 per hour? Oh, okay. I'm sorry if somebody's speaking, I, it's not on the record. Christopher Lepore, for the record, apologies for the lack of the decorum. Um, as my understanding is, uh, cigar lounge is in a casino today. It's 15. One five or five? One five. <laughs> Member Dret, that's what I thought. I thought it was, what about like bars with smoke? I've heard anywhere between eight to 10. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Gentlemen, ladies, apologies. Thank you for, for, aid, for the aid and comfort. <laughs> Ed Alexander, for the record, I think that the NCA and and uh, Solid have put forth some some tremendous effort in moving the dialogue forward. I I think that the deputy mile or uh, yeah deputy miles and staff have been very accommodating and back and forth. One 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 thing that I would provide caution to is getting overly granular at this point as to these requirements. I, I think it's important to understand that, you know, the, the kind of the pink elephant in the room is if gaming and other vital components in Nevada were not exempt from air quality standards, we wouldn't have casinos in, in Southern Nevada. People, we're, we're, we're not looking to degradate the environment through the, through the exhaust coming from the facilities. We're not looking for folks to uh, unintentionally be exposed as your kids were to the hot box situation. But, but, but there's also some implied consent when you walk into a facility and, and, and the expectation is you're entering a cannabis lounge. I, I, I can't stress enough. We, we, this is a stride forward. But but you get too granular with this, and then we figure out that there's an enforcement component that that was un you know unforeseen like like it was at the application period, and now we we've, we've set folks up you know to fail. So so just be mindful of of other kind of similar situations, and 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 while we may be similar to a cigar bar, I I. I've walked into some cigar lounges and I've never experienced anything as thick and robust as, as what's happening in those types of, of situation or, or facilities. So again, I just, I just want to make sure that we walk down this very, very, very carefully because there's been some good work that's gone into it, but it may not have been enough work. We may, we may need to be looking at other industries that exist and say, what happens to a gaming establishment with these air regu similar air regulations in place? So again, you know, for the record, I, I, I think let's not paint ourselves into a box with regulatory language that, that can't be unwound because I think there's a, a absence of understanding on both sides of, that, of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I just realized I should not have mentioned the name of the casino. Hello. Good morning. Kara Cronkite, for the record, Chief of the Inspection and Audit Division at the CCB. Um, just a little bit of information and history. Um, this requirement is really just for the workers. It's more focused on the workers' protection. We don't want them leaving the facility intoxicated or being exposed to carcinogens or other toxic compounds that are being released from the smoke and secondhand smoke. So that's really the intention of this uh, framework. Um, smoking areas, typically for a um, accommodation framework, have six to 10 air exchanges per hour. Um, but this assumes smoking is allowed and not everybody in the room is smoking. Um, from data collected from ASHRA, NAFA, and EPA, um, so car lounges, they typically recommend um, 20 to 30 air exchanges per hour and also for smoking lounges. Um, to make the air, again, this isn't to make the air safe necessarily. They've said that that would take about 293 
air changes per hour, which would create like a tornado effect <laughs> that we're not looking for here. Um, we're just trying to make it safe for that occasional entrance of the workers who have that required exposure. And I'm available for questions if you need me. Okay. Uh, Member Grant, for the record, uh, it, I have a question for you. Um, I think everybody did the best they could in this situation, and um, and and I'm glad that we're able to make allow these licensees to go forward. I just want to see that we have like agility and flexibility, and we don't get tied to these numbers. Like in the past, you know, like the the five pound lot, you know, the five pounds was created. At some point, it probably maybe there's been a lot more data since then, and we haven't revisited it. So, I just want to make sure that we're flexible about these numbers as we get more information in. Yeah, absolutely. And with the CCB, we're always um, welcoming new information. And if anyone has any studies or data to, sug to suggest that different numbers are adequate, I'm not going to say safe, but adequate and acceptable, then we're happy to review that information as well. Thanks. Good morning, board. Chanel Lindsay, for the record. Um, I'm here to take a little bit of a turn and discuss an alternative um, to these HVAC systems that we've been discussing today. Um, I came and presented at the last meeting and I'm here with some additional supplemental information to show um, that there is a technology available um, that folks can use that actually um, exceeds the standards um, of the current cigar lounges. Um, and so very proud of this technology because it actually prevents any smoke from going into the air in the first place. So. Not only is it a more affordable alternative, it actually is something that has, will have better public health outcomes, especially for employees working in the cigar lounges, I mean, in the consumption lounges. Um, and so what I presented um, and passed out today is some additional information showing the PPM readings from this technology um, and that they are on average half of the PPM readings of the cigar lounges and the current regulations. Um, and so we are not trying to lower the standard in any way um, today, just trying to provide an alternative um, that is uh, more affordable, that would help equity businesses come online. Um, and you can see, again, that the readings that we have um, been able to show you and the supporting video evidence as well um, shows that this is a, an option, again, that looks to the, the um, health of the workers and doesn't expose them to smoke um, and also allows for portability um, in this technology that doesn't necessarily tie an applicant to any particular property because that's something that we found um, has been a big barrier for folks, the expense of um, often outfitting a, a, a building that you don't even own. Um, and so I just wanted to present this additional information in support of the changes to the regulations that would add a provision um, allowing for this alternative to these HVAC systems. And again, um, thinking of bringing a higher quality standard here, um, you can see with this technology even at rest, um, I mean, even at active smoking with five joints burning in a very small four by four, 14 by 14 room, um, you have air quality that is twice as good as um, a cigar lounge um, as it stands, even with the 30 air changes required uh, per hour. Anyone have any questions? Uh, Member Dratt, for the record, so the language currently proposed that would allow for your invention to be used in Lounge, yeah, so, so you're covered under this language. Exactly. And um, going further, we even made a requirement that the um, that there would have to be a report put forward to the, the board every year as part of the annual licensing to just show, um, again, the continued um, efficacy of the systems. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Scott Rutledge for the record with our Gentum partners. Uh, Having worked on this legislation back in 2021, definitely the intent of getting these lounges open was to find a place where one, people who were now consuming um, illegally, as it were, would have a place to go, um, which is why we wanted to ensure we had some of these 
near and adjacent to the tourist corridor. Uh, two, these needed to be venues where it was also somewhat affordable. Um, you, you can't have it be such an expensive proposition to operate these businesses that you're charging so much for people to come because they won't show up. Uh, in, in regards to the flexibility that's been discussed today, I, one of the things I think you're hearing from the industry and comments that were made during the promulgation of these regulations with the advisory committee groups, et cetera, is that we didn't know how much it would cost when this initial 30 turns an hour was proposed. And as written today, that is still going to be a major concern. Um, I don't think that we should just lower it and say, do your best guys. And, you know, we'll, we'll check back in, in a year, um, from the comments that were proposed by reset, uh, a couple things that were in, uh, section nine as written with basically that you would use a ventilation system that includes an odor containment and elimination device that achieves or exceeds the air quality of systems that meet the national ambient air quality standards. And then it lists some different options. And I think these options, that's what's important. And again, whether it's using a personal device, which I'm not sure and if I had a venue that I would want people using respirators to blow smoke into, it doesn't feel fit the vibe of what I would want to do. But if you had a option for that, certainly let's do that. But let's also you know, use the technology that's available today to clean up the air inside the venue without having to hit 30 turns an hour. And so, Something that uh, I would ask for today is that as opposed to approving what has been proposed, um, I think perhaps coming back to this one more time, or if there was you know, some sort of uh, an option to, again, remove the 30 turns and reduce that to a number with some sort of language that says, but you have to do these other things. And by the way, an annual report back would be required. And if you're not meeting those standards, then just like in any cannabis establishment, uh, the board and staff can say, look, you're going to need to make some changes. You need to update your SOPs. That what you said would work isn't working. Um, that's the type of flexibility I think we should be looking for. Second, I'm not sure all of these venues are going to be filled with people just smoking cannabis. Uh, one of the goals of, of the legislation was to create a ready to consume category, including beverages and infused food. Um, you have a lot of people that might be interested in attending because uh, as Mr. Alexander mentioned, right, these have to be venues that aren't just about consuming cannabis because I can do that currently where I'm doing it today. I need a reason to show up, right? So entertainment and food and, you know, a, a vibe, if you will. And I think that you're going to see a number of folks that will choose not to smoke cannabis, but instead imbibe in another fashion. And so if you have these requirements for a venue, and maybe 10% of your patrons are smoking, and maybe that's your business plan. Maybe you're not pushing uh, combustibles. Maybe you are focused on, say, cannabis cocktails and whatnot. Again, the cost and expense that's currently required, I think, is still a big issue. So again, asking for that flexibility and how we address, I think, each one of these businesses, which today under their conditional approvals are still going to have to come back with a lot more detail, right? I know some of those details haven't been provided yet because of this specific issue. Um, and I definitely think it's something that we could solve for um, with maybe a couple more weeks. Obviously, having this issue come up, a lot of us just got done with the legislative session. Um, I think there's been some discussion that hasn't happened amongst the various stakeholders since the last time this was discussed. And it would be nice to see that happen maybe one more time before we make any final decisions. Either that or uh, approve something along the lines of the suggestion from Reset, because I think that makes sense in terms of flexibility. Can I ask a question? Uh, Member Drett, for the record, um, I am very strongly in favor of going forward on these so that the licensees that are ready can go forward. They're ready to open. And they a lot. there was a lot of parts. There were a lot of workshops. There was a lot of participation that, um, from those that are ready to go forward. Uh, would there be a disadvantage or would there be a, a big problem or do you see a foresee, foresee a big problem with if these were approved today and then revisiting it very quickly and perhaps taking in more consideration from those that, you know, I, I, I need you to go wake up your colleagues <laughs> that have not participated. Um, those that, you know, are taking, are going to take longer. Those who are not going to be able to afford this current system, get them involved. And I would, I would, 
like to see it come back soon to revisit these issues, but would you see a problem with approving these today? And then potentially if the board was willing, make changes accommodating other proposals later. Uh, again, Scott Rutledge for the record. I like probably everyone in this room and most of the board would like to proceed. Obviously, we'd like to get some of these businesses open. Definitely would like to be able to come back. I think to the, I should clarify, we know a lot of people were involved in the initial process since the time the regulations were approved. And then folks started to go out and hire engineers and go, okay, we have to meet this 30 air exchanges an hour. What will that cost? Since that occurred, until now, we've been pretty busy with a legislative session. There was one other hearing, as I recall, back in April, I guess it was, maybe May. Um, but but there are going to be probably other folks that are going to come forward as they're putting their proposals together and they're getting, maybe they haven't gotten to that point of getting the engineer to their facility and they're going to go, oh, wow, I can't afford to do this. So the way is written today, again, at 30 air exchanges an hour, that is going to continue to be a problem. I promise it's not going to go away. That's the one piece I would want to change. I would want to lower that number. Maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20. Some have said single digits, but whatever that number could be, if we could lower that at least today. So now instead of trying to figure out how to get to 30, maybe it's figure out how to get to 20. And if that's still going to be a problem, but you have other solutions, that would be the request today is instead of 30, go to 20. Again, if you go to a tavern today, anywhere in Las Vegas, where there's gaming and food and people are smoking, the people that are working there choose to work there. They know people smoke. Same with people that work in a cigar lounge. Same with folks that work in other businesses. When you apply for a job to work at a cannabis social use venue, a lounge, and you know smoking is going to be taking place, certainly you're choosing to work in an environment where people will be smoking. And at the same time, um, as a, someone going to work there, you probably want to have conversations with the owners and your employer about what are we doing to help mitigate, you know, my exposure, right? So it's, it's, I do think we certainly have to think about protecting folks that are working there. No amount of smoke is ever safe, right? Um, and also it was mentioned during those commission meetings that cannabis smoke is actually not found to be carcinogenic, which is why we did not include nicotine products or allow them like blunt wraps and whatnot, because those are carcinogenic, but cannabis has never been shown to be carcinogenic. And as far as, again, the, what level of smoke is safe? I mean, no smoke is safe, but as we all experienced here the last few summers with wildfires, I mean, walking outside isn't safe. So just want to ask for flexibility and an opportunity to do something. So if, again, the decision by the board today were to approve it at 30 turns an hour, I mean, instead of 30 to 20, right? Maybe someone can come back and say, we can make that pencil out for now. Or maybe they're going to come back and as a condition of their final approval on their license, say, hey, we can't get to this number, but we would request uh, a waiver. And, and maybe that's the issue. Maybe you provide a waiver, but you have to demonstrate that you're going to get there another way. Maybe that's what we need to do. Um, Member Gret, I have now I have four more questions. So keep the answers very short because or I'm going to get cut off. Okay. So one, I, I there was a study recently uh, relating to the whether cannabis is carcinogenic, right? I mean, I would never take, it's never been proven as carcinogenic as evidence that it's not carcinogenic, but there was a study, I think uh, your colleague, Mr. Laporte, uh, brought that up. There was a study about, um, I think, kind of reevaluating that maybe it's not. Okay, well, I'll find that later. Um, I, I, for the record, I'm aware that there was a longitudinal study done in Australia on cannabis consumption, and they actually accounted for people who also smoke tobacco products, and they found that nobody in the group over 25 years actually had any or any issues with cancer for people who just consume cannabis. But again, it's really hard to separate that because sometimes people who smoke cannabis are also doing right. other things that right. have access to things that could be carcinogenic. Right. Remember, so, Gret, uh, I think Chief Cronkite brought to my attention, if you want me to read this into the record yeah. real quick. I'm sorry. This is about speaking? secondhand smoke. If, excuse me, who's speaking? Oh, sorry. This is Deputy Director Michael Miles. Um, again, this is about secondhand smoke. A study published in Nature uh, demonstrated that cannabis smoke is similar to tobacco smoke in regards to carcinogens and other toxic compounds. 110 in cannabis, 69 as the same as in tobacco, where there's 173 compounds in tobacco. There's still a risk of heart attacks. And again, you're, 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 this, is the combustion, uh, sorry, the, this is the combustion of organic materials. So again, it's very similar. To yeah. Tobacco. Director I, Miles, could you restate who that? study was performed by 
Again, yeah, this is this is a study on secondhand smoke in was it uh, Nature publication? I have in the back of my head, head somewhere. I need to find it. It was like it was it was like Harvard or or Yale or something published something recently. I'll find what I'm what I was thinking about. Um, what, what what's the turnover rate? One more time in casinos. Can you tell me in gaming establishments? I believe it's twenty, but I, I think it depends on what sections and also with their lead certification because some of the lead gold properties do a higher turn. Some of them don't even allow smoking. When you think of a tavern license here in Nevada, I don't know for sure, but I do think it's less than 15. It might be somewhere between eight and 12. Um, and that is actually a more appropriate thing to compare to or taverns because they're smaller venues. Yeah. So I have a question for Kara. Um, sorry. I'll, I'll ask one more question while you're coming up. Well, I'll wait for you. I have another one for you, Scott. Um, so, what did did the amount of um, does the amount of smoke contribute to how much we would what the, the what we would require? So, say if they had a model that didn't entail much smoking, would we want to be flexible or have a different requirement for the amount of smoke? Kara Cronkite, for the record, yes, that's correct. Um, there's different standards for if you have five to six smokers in a room versus 20 to 30 smokers in a room, that would definitely have an impact on the amount of um, air turnover that you'd like to see. The, the different filters that we're talking about just trap certain size, um, certain micron size of particles in the air. Um, that's what they're capable of doing. So the more frequently that you turn that air over, the more of those are going to get captured and less likely to be re-inhaled by um, the people in the room. Oh, thank you. So it sounds like I think you kind of suggested this. What may make sense going forward is having different requirements for different models. Uh, Scott Rhodes, for the record, uh, again, I, I think a waiver on the 30 turns with a plan that says here's how we're going to protect our patrons and our employees is what we would be asking for. And that waiver again would be on a case by case basis. We see this a lot of times with land use decisions and other things, um, giving this industry and these businesses an opportunity to submit a waiver and have a plan and go, look, our venue is different than this venue over here. It looks different. And here's how we're gonna solve for that. By the way, our business model says this, um, you know, uh, this, that kind of flexibility, I think would be very helpful. So the last thing I'd say is, you know, the moment this was raised, the the chair and the executive director said, oh, we got to change this. So I think I would it would just be great for everyone if going forward, you know, there was a level of participation, um, providing this information as we go along. And then if there was flexibility on our part to make sure we are changing as that information comes along. And I don't mean new data because we're not going to wait for new studies. I mean, new approaches, even just philosophical discussions, like, well, do we want to let them do, if employees want to work in these places, do we want to let, you know, stuff like that. So I don't mean just new data. I mean, I think these discussions very much need to be ongoing. Uh, any additional comment? No, thank you again. Uh, this, this is Member Young. I did, I did at least want to make one comment there. I, there's definitely an association between marijuana use and the risk of cancer. It's actually I have at least one article here published in the, uh, it was in the Journal of American Medical Association in November of uh, 2019. Um, and that's actually the title of the article, Association Between Marijuana Use and Risk of Cancer. Um, but I do support, with, with Member Dredd, I, I think I do support the current regulation. I, I pulled a number of studies, and, and there's actually a very interesting one in the Journal of, let me pull this up, Analytical Toxicology, specifically looked at at ventilation in regards to um, workers testing positive for THC. And actually, with even a modest level of ventilation, um, the workers did not test positive. Um, so that, that's certainly encouraging to me. But we do know that, you know, there's there's no level of secondhand smoke that's safe. I just don't know any way that we can get around that. I, I, at least I think the current regulation tries to to treat not only the exposure to THC, but also creating enough fresh air to protect workers. Uh, Member Young, was it, is that specifically lung cancer? I'm thinking maybe it was 
lung cancer that has recently gotten vindicated. Say they specifically mention I'm trying um oh, it's a number of cancer, four cancers, uh lung, head and neck, squamous cell, uh, testicular germ cell. Um so a, a number of different cancers. Thanks. Go ahead, say your name. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nicole Bafong, for the record. I represent the Chamber of Cannabis as a board of director, and I also represent the Minorities for Medical Marijuana uh, as their national program director. Uh, I would like to first uh, say thank you to the board for hosting a workshop back in April to address the concern from consumption venue licensees regarding air quality regulation. Um, and I'd also like to make a quick comment um, that no medical, no research, um, and I'd be interested to know who paid for the research that said you know, can cannabis smoke causes cancer, um, but there's no research that says uh, right now to date uh, that secondhand smoke causes people to get high. Um, and so, and or test positive for THC, like he mentioned. Um, and so it'd be interesting to, this opportunity right here that we have um, by having consumption lounges and presenting new opportunities with new innovative um, inventions, uh, we could test that. We could be the test market. We could be do the research that is required to find out exactly um, what type of contact or what type of um, cons um, it, I, I would say consumption happens, secondhand consumption happens to employees. So I think this is a perfect research market to do it. Um, when I learned that these regulations were so expensive to meet qualifications for operators that they decided to opt out of allowing combustion inside their new consumption venue, I was not sure what could be done. And then the solution appeared. The Ardent, a tabletop decarboxylizer that has helped countless medical patients, brilliant inventor Chanel Lindsay released her newest invention, the Billow a closed loop filtration system that keeps the smoke from filling up the room. After presenting the Billows technology at the workshop in April and submitting new language, I'm sorry, <laughs> after presenting the Billow technology at the workshop in April and submitting new language to be considered for amending the regulation, we are now ready for a vote to add this new language. It is important for all viable technology to be an option, especially where it is improvement over traditional methods. This new language creates a less expensive alternative for license holders to meet air quality regulations, mitigates odor, and drastically reduces contact smoke that the staff would be exposed to, improving public health outcomes. I'm excited to support the new language and thrilled that Nevada will be the first to step into the future of consumption. Thank you. Anyone else in Las Vegas? Ed Alexander, for the record, I apologize for coming back again and again. Um, you know, we've got air standard qualities that have been established in many different industries. And I can just tell you this, in Northern Nevada, guys, whether it's 10 air exchanges an hour, 30 air exchanges an hour, I got five to seven months of the year that the outdoor air quality based on half of California being on fire is more challenging than anything we're going to experience in a cannabis lounge. One of the concerns that, that me and my engineering staff have is the ability to actually treat the incoming air into the facility as opposed to the outgoing air. Because remember, with an air exchange, we're dealing with the pollutants that exist outside of our facilities as frequently as we're dealing with pollutants inside. I would also say that Based on the fact that we've talked about the monetization of this industry, when you buy a $12 pre-roll and occupy a four-top table in a consumption lounge for an hour, that has a far lower return on investment than if somebody is utilizing a low, low, low dose drink, for example, or an infused food. Nobody's brought up, hey, are these air quality standards going to be in place with the zero to 30 air exchanges during the period of time that the facility is not operational. We're open eight hours a day, but we're treating air. Or we're exchanging air at an expense for the other period of time that we're not open. I was just 
reminded that as of July 1st, the board's ability to modify things radically changes based on the legislative session. Again, soft and gentle about what we put in place because we got 11 days until we can't unnecessarily unwind the clock. So I'm, I'm in support of us pushing this forward. We want to get open, but we also want to make sure we don't back ourselves into a corner that, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, internal air quality standards versus air exchanges per hour, you know, appear to be a, a much more thoughtful way of moving forward. I apologize. I wasn't as involved in, in, in this discussion as I would have liked to be. But between trying to maintain operational compliance during a very tumultuous time in the industry, the legislative session, everything else that's going on, it's tough to juggle everything that uh, is required of us as operators and still provide good input to make sure that the voices are being heard. So, again, up in the north, guys, I mean, there's days that, guess what, can't even leave your house because the air quality is so bad. And, and, and to introduce that inside of a facility can be challenging. I, I could fail air, air quality standards simply because I'm dragging in, uh, you know, burning smoke. The measurement, you know, the, I've, I've been the test case guys for, for, for odor remediation uh, in the entire state. I can tell you there's a ton of technology that exists that has nothing to do with filtration. There's sulfur binding compounds that can, that can be introduced into the outgoing airstream of your facility that, that mitigate the odor. So just just keep an open mind and, and uh, don't back yourselves or us into a corner. Thank you. Hi, my name is Morgan Baiselli. I'm here present, uh, with, representing Silver State Government Relations. Um, we just suggest that um, using a measurement as precise as air particles, uh, parts per million to identify the air quality is inappropriate. Um, the uncontrollable environment influence and variability of outside air parts per million alone could be enough to cause a lounge to possibly fail. For example, in Northern Nevada maybe where we've had um, fire events on and off for the last five years. And that's all I would like to put on the record. Thank you. Seeing no one else at this time, here in Clark, do we have anyone in Northern Nevada in Carson City who wishes to uh, make a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members, Brett Scolari, Strategies 360. Um, I won't take a lot of your time. I echo a lot of the comments that have been made. Um, I did participate as best I could, um, just joining Strategies in December. Um, I did submit a draft regulation that um, um, was aimed to kind of put this um, in line with taverns, um, but it did not make this version, um, unfortunately. So I would... Um, I would support the notion of having some flexibility. If we can build it into this version, that'd be great. But I would commit um, my resources and our clients' resources to further discuss this. I think we all agree that we can't legislate the smoke away. So we need to, or regulate the smoke away. So we need to find alternatives and, and create a, a lower barrier of entry. I think the 30 air exchanges is gonna be problematic. Um, for a lot of these operators, especially the social equity um, licensees, um, we want to get them off the ground. Um, we also have air experts that have looked at this as far as cigar bars and, and um, taverns um, with our local governments. I think there's our quality divisions that have looked at this. Um, perhaps they need to be involved, but I think um, if we all can get together and find a, a solution that works and gives folks flexibility, not every operator is going to be the same. Some are going to be heavy on food and edibles. Um, some might be heavier smoking lounges. Um, some will have outdoor smoking. Some won't have outdoor smoking. So I just don't think we can all fit in one category on this, especially on the air exchange requirements. So. Those are my comments. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I um, would be happy to continue to participate. And I really do appreciate um, Mr. Klimas, Mr. Miles um, and Ms. Cronkite for their work on this. They have been 
very collaborative and have tried to move this forward in a positive direction for everyone. So I do thank them for that. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple questions for, yeah. before it's for Brett. Okay. It's for Mr. Sclary. I tried to I escape. Ahead. Okay. Let me, let me, uh, okay. Okay. Well, actually, the first one is for um, Mike. Um, what is the rate in casinos? I mean, it, it, they are all different. So is, it just depends. Can you give me a rundown? Honestly, I cannot. Okay. There's a lot of different standards. Okay. So so for Mr. Sclary, what you propose language to make it similar to taverns, how so? I, I don't have it in front of me. Sorry. I don't have my draft in front of me. I apologize, but I believe it was at eight air exchanges um, per hour was what I suggested. Um, it was it was something based on, um, I think, some regulations that our mechanical engineers from one of our clients had looked at, and that was the suggestion, but it did not make it in this version. So, um, so that is similar to taverns under, is that local ordinance or state law? Do you know? I believe it was based upon um, current air quality standards for a cigar or lounge or a, or a tavern, um, but I don't know the exact site. I apologize. Yes, Kara. Um, Kara Cronkite for the record. Um, yes, yeah, smoking areas do typically have six to 10 air exchanges per hour, but that's more for nuisance odor. It's considered accommodation framework and it's not really intended to um, get rid of any of those um, toxic compounds that might be in the air from secondhand smoke. Um, that's also assuming that that only a few people in the room are smoking. So um, the cigar lounges, um, as I previously stated, and the smoking lounges that do exist today, the recommended air exchanges per hour are between 20 to 30 based on ASHRAE, NAFA, and EPA. So I apologize because I had also plenty of time to ask these questions and did not. And I did not think I would have this many questions. I, I every, you know, everything seemed to be going smoothly. I didn't think I actually need to understand this. But now that I do, it looks like there's a disparity in what type of, of what we're looking at, the numbers we're looking at. There's no agreement it sounds like on the numbers because we all have different lounges in mind as we discuss them. Um, so I have a question for the AG's office. If, if we wanted to change something, if there was any appetite to change something at this hearing, would that be possible since it, the language has already been publicly noticed? If it's not a substantive change, usually you could change at this point. And so I guess the question sorry, we're trying to do. Of speaking? Uh, sorry, let me turn on my microphone. Rosalie Bordelov for the record. Um, it, with ordinary, and, and I might defer to some extent to your DAGs, because until July 1st, your regulation rules are a little bit different than the standard, but usually at the hearing, um, you're listening to and considering all the public comment, you can make some changes. Um, you may have a little bit more ability to change based on your regulations. Once you switch over in July, you're going to have less ability because if you make a real substantive change, it's going to have to go back to LCB for review, but you don't have the same level of review. So I don't know if, the, if Chris, <laughs> if you want to pipe in knowing yours a little more specifically, but um, ordinarily you can make more minor changes, but a, a more substantive change at this point sometimes would require greater noticing. Well, the only issue would be we'd still have to go in front of the legislative commission for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and it would be quicker under the current scheme. But I think that's the only difference. Okay. Um, because if what's envisioned under the proposed language is a cigar bar, that's just not how a lot of these places are going to operate. These, these standards are set up for smoking rooms. So Again, if they're planning on having a restaurant or something, these ventilation lounges or these ventilation requirements wouldn't apply. But it may However, if they are going to have smokers yeah. in a enclosed space, then yes, these standards would apply. But it might not be much smoking. <laughs> but, but and that it's relevant because, like we just discussed with Kara, that's relevant. How much? How much? What's the ratio of smoke to edibles? And Kara Cronkite, for the record, that that is true, but also the size of the space right. come into consideration. So there's there's a lot of factors that would have to be considered. Um, 
I, I think going with the, my, you know, my personal opinion, going with the traditional standard that is recommended by all the air quality experts of, you know, smoking lounges being 20 to 30 air exchanges is a lot simpler than when you get into the nitty gritty details of um, cubic feet, mm-hmm. you know, per, how many people, how many cubic feet of air there is in the area um, and how how much smoke will be in that area. It turns into more of an equation that is specific to every single facility rather than just a standard number that's easy to apply across the board. Um, so when you start talking about how many people are smoking and and how big the facility is, it gets very complicated. Member Durrett, I'm going to hold you at this point. I think we had one more person up in northern Nevada who wanted to speak. I'd like to hear from them at this time. Uh, and then we can kind of proceed to the other end. I know that uh, Director Clemens has a statement. He also would just pick up. Hi, good morning. Lake Martin, Executive Director of the Nevada Cannabis Association. First, wanted to echo the comments thanking staff and the board for being responsive to the industry um, and for incorporating stakeholder input. We as well had submitted language that was more flexible than what's included here, but we appreciate that um, Solid Consulting brought forth um, ex- an expert recommendation, um, and so we're supportive of the language. Um, what's been clear throughout this discussion is that these lounges are going to be different sizes, they're going to have fewer smokers, more smokers, and if we are, if the board is able to make a small change, um, we would recommend going forward with adoption today so that these lounges can operate, but potentially considering changing the ventilation plan from a must to a may in the first provision. Because the ventilation plan would still be required to be submitted and approved, the board would still have the opportunity to take into consideration the different factors affecting the lounges and the different factors that, you know, that that we should be considering. Um, And with some potentially minimum requirements and in the alternative, potentially a waiver um, so that it could take into consideration all these different factors. Thank you. Director Klamas. Before we proceed further, uh, we're going to take probably about a 10-minute break. Uh, Let's say 20 after the hour, we'll come back on record. For that, we're in recess.
I know, right? Good. We're coming back on the record at this time as the item number six, the consideration of the regulation uh, for the board to discuss this in the open meeting uh, in terms of what we're doing, whether or not we are accepting what's been presented, staying within the confines of the subject matter. So it's not a material change. Um, and the concerns voiced in terms of air handler changes per minute and such, or whether the, the May, uh, May and the concerns about ar being arbitrary and capricious, but uh, if we have other insight and also more specifically concerns as to the passage of new legislation, which changes our ability to adopt and now lengthens the period of adoption and whether or not part of this might give us the ability to do something today and still have a short window for minor changes or whether we're stuck with um, if we don't do something today, we have a longer window to have to do this under the other regulations. Those are some of the concerns and I wanna to turn to our staff and see what they might have to say as to possibly looking at the balancing as a separate ventilation system. We have 30 and 20 in the ordinance. Uh, is it possible to, to lower that and still achieve uh, the goal that was set forth as to balancing pressure, negative and positive flow. And I'm not the scientist, but so if you can give us some guidance on that for my question and some of the other board members likewise have some other more specific questions. Chair Tyler Climbers for the record. And, and yes, I think we potentially have a couple changes for today and then maybe some future changes um, we can Pursue. I just wanted to say, though, first, you know, flexibility with these consumption lounge regulations has been the name of the game from day one. Uh, every conversation we've had, every interview that we've had, we've always known we were going to need to make some tweaks once we launch these. That's where we're at today. Uh, that's where we'll be at in the future, no matter what uh, procedures we have to go through on the regulatory side. It's also why today this draft in front of you, as, as we've stated, uh, this included a stakeholder group of every single individual that commented on air ventilation requirements in the last two years. And that's what this consensus, and I want to say that consensus document uh, is that we're considering. That being said, uh, after the comments today, and again, we appreciate the participation, certainly appreciate participation more on the front end uh, to help these kinds of hearings. But I do think... Um, there's a couple potential changes that we can consider. Uh, I will kick it to Deputy Director Michael Miles and Chief Kara Cronkite to talk through those potential changes. And again, uh, from the staff perspective, uh, we would support getting something on the books uh, or the board just considering adopting something today out of this meeting, um, knowing that we will potentially take another shot at July or uh, months after uh, as necessary. So with that, uh, Deputy Miles, if you want to kind of lead on the changes. I'm just going to hand it over to Chief Cronkite. She's the expert on this. I'm Kara Cronkite for the record. Um, NCCR 15.055 subsection 1 requirements are for designated smoking rooms. So we don't want to see smoking in the same area where the workers have to complete their entire shift. They should be separated. Studies published in the National Institute of Health and the Journal of Analytical Toxicology have demonstrated that secondhand cannabis smoke um, can lead to, or does lead to cannabinoid metabolites in their bodily fluid. Um, so they would not pass a drug test and um, experienced, they experienced psychotropic effects when compared to placebos. So they were um, having intoxicating effects from the cannabis just from secondhand smoke. Um, the recommended range for such rooms is 20 to 30 air changes per minute. It would not be substantial change to utilize the lower end of this range and require 20 air changes per, per hour. Sorry, I said per minute earlier, per hour. Um, it would also then make sense to change subsection two for the rest of the lounge to be consistent with the low end for taverns or other places where um, smoking is not strictly prohibited. Um, 
and reduce that from 20 down to six changes per hour. And so just to recap, Bort, so we would go to the low end of still the standard that we sought, again, um, keeping in mind worker safety, that's really where our approach on this uh, came from. So we would go to the lower end of the standard we set out to achieve at the beginning um, for you to consider today, hopefully providing a little bit more flexibility um, for those today, and then pinning uh, potential future meetings, even July plus, as uh, you know, if there's some more flexibility measures that make sense, and we can discuss those and potentially uh, act on those as well. Rihanna, question. Okay. <laughs> uh, Member Durant, for the record. Um, uh, thank you. I appreciate. I again, I apologize. Nobody is more guilty than me right now of having not understood this until now, and um, and I really again appreciate that. The executive director was immediately willing to change um, the HVAC as soon as it was brought to his attention. So um, thank you again. Um, with regards to uh, changing uh, the must to a may to, to bridge us to when we have more discussions on this, would that potentially work? Or what are there concerns about that? Unfortunately, I think that really substantially changes the reg. It, it gets, it creates, at least what we have right now, we have a nice, simple, bright line rule. We're just slightly lowering the standards still within the framework that we were trying to achieve. So we still have a, a bright line rule. If we were to try to change it to May, that's completely, could potentially completely change the standards that we're setting aside, which would be a substantial change to the regulations. And maybe I'm just not being creative enough, but I think if we did that, what would the standards be? It would all we wouldn't have any standards, right? But maybe somebody more creative than I than me could come up with a potential solution to that quickly. But I I think just from my perspective, it makes the most sense to go with the lower numbers, doesn't substantially change it, so we're okay with our noticing laws, but notice while we're here at the meeting to make sure we're in the 30 days, let me make sure that works with the AG. Again, my opinion would be we notice this same language for the next meeting so that we do not, um, we're well within our rights to make changes at the next meeting. And and I, th I, I from my perspective, but again, people smarter than me are going to have to propose that language. We need language that isn't a one size fits all. I think we do need language for different um, models. Would would that be would that be acceptable for the record if you can i don't know if you still have it up the language that pertains to the regulation and how that impacts us or may impact us uh rosalie wardle for the record are you referring to the ch the statutory change that just passed i do have that still up to the extent that um you um like to hear at least with respect to its effects this is sb 328 um the Amendatory provisions regarding the use of 233B apply to regulations which are proposed by the Cannabis Compliance Board on or after the effective date of the act. Um, the act is effective upon passage and approval, which I believe should have already occurred. Let me give a date for when that fit alone. Um, it was approved on June 14th. And signed by the governor. So that would be when this act went into effect was on, uh, it is already in effect. Um, but to the extent that you are using language you have already um, proposed, we can consider this still. This language you have today was proposed prior to the act going into effect. Um, and that is why it's still using the old provisions. It's a little the language isn't incredibly clear when it comes to um, changes to that language. Is that new? Is that not? Um, but I think uh, it sounds like the consensus is to go forward today with where you are. Um, if you'd like to notice for the next meeting, um, as we discussed, there's, there's uh, you could definitely make the argument that this is considered already proposed language um, and you're still working on an already proposed regulation. Thank you. That was <laughs> Thank you.
thoughts by other board, board members? So, I'm sorry, thoughts by other board members? This, this is Member Young. I, I, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, I would be in support of these changes. Um, ultimately, no secondhand smoke is good for you. So, but anything we can do to mitigate these factors, and I think if we're talking about the smoking room aspect of it, the you know the studies suggest that even modest ventilation reduces the risk to the employee in terms of turning positive for THC. Um, so, I think the certainly the, the lower level of the, I think we said six to eight in the non-smoking area. Is that what, what we're talking about? Correct. Um, and I think that meets the current standards for the taverns. So um, anyway, so I would be in support of this. Member Merritt or Member Freilich, do you have either one of you wish to weigh in at all? No, I have no comment. Mr. Chairman, I, I would be in support of the um, of the of staff's recommendations uh, unless we hear from uh, the industry as to um, any other recommendations um, and would also agree with our DAG that we can continue to vet this until uh, next month, but um, but, but I'm in agreement with the new numbers, lowering it to um, 20 for subsection one and six to subsection two. Thank you. I, too, I too support the change in, in the numbers so that uh, we create a relationship between the negative and positive and lower those standards, make it more flexible. There's some other considerations uh, involved uh, since there's been other things thrown out this day, but I would propose that we pass what we have in part this day with the ability to come back uh, and make a final, or I could say second final determination um, at our next meeting if what we've heard or what possibly we've not heard gets submitted so we can consider that. Um, and I might look to the council for language to put that secondary condition in of passing these two changes this date with the ability to modify if we keep this on for next month. So that would be the the ball I throw in the air. If we have some language, that's my proposal. Uh, so council, if we were to adopt these two changes uh, in 15.055, amend in sub one, 30 to 20, and amend in section two, 20 to six and the other changes set forth this day as to ventilation of cannabis consumption lounges. And would it be appropriate to say hold open for additional changes that um, fit within this regulation? Uh, Rosalie Bordelup for the record. So yes, I mean, the language you were saying is, is pretty clear. I guess the only clarifications I would put so it's really clear to staff is the changes you're making right now, um, you're having those effective now. Um, and I guess just that if for the industry and for staff to be clear, you're holding open the, the possibility of making additional changes at your next meeting. But um, that those change it, it, just something so that industry participants, if they start, if they open and start um, practicing pursuant to what you pass today, 
um, you're not looking at a drastic change, you know, if they continue, whatever you might do would be less stringent perhaps than what you did today. So that if they set up procedures, um, into effect based on today's standards, those would still probably be compliant past whatever you do later. Give them a little bit of certainty and give staff certainty so that they know what's in effect now and what can be enforced. I guess the bottom line yeah. and what you just said, the proposal would be such that it would not be stricter. It would stay yeah. material and would not be substantial. Mm -hmm. That's for the board to think of. That's what I, I would propose this day. But um, I want to see if any other board member has any thoughts or questions. Finalize that type of thought. Chair, this is Tyler Clemens for the record. One more change would be in sub nine, sub A. Um, we should probably change 30 to 20 to align with the change above that. Thank you. With that being said, um, any other members have any thoughts as to what uh, we wish to do with this hot potato this morning? Uh, Member Dredd, one other thing I wanted to add is those that are going forward under the current language, they're here and they are fully aware that that they are, that the, it may become less strict. So, you, so there will not be room to return to a later meeting saying that that you shouldn't that you had to follow these regs, so other people should have to follow these regs. So, just want that on the record. Without stating that's what lawyers are for. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, do we have any from the board members, any other uh, quite sub substantive comments? Um, if someone would like to make, make a motion as to this, or if not, I can make the motion. Um, if we're ready to do that. I will make a motion to make amendments this day or changes, not amendments, but changes that are not material uh, because it fits the subject matter we're contemplating as to 15.055 as proposed, sub one, changing that from 30 to 20. And line two, uh, separate system, changing that from 20 to six. And additionally at sub nine, small a, changing the 30 to 20. And note that we will be adopting, may adopt additional changes that are cannot be considered material. They stay within the subject matter at our next meeting as the consumption lounge ventilation requirements. That would be my motion. Before I go any further, does that kind of fit the four corners from our AG's viewpoint. That is a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? It's member Young, I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Now any additional discussion or statements? Oh, additional discussion, one I would, <laughs> again, Member Dret, if so help me God, if you guys want changes and you don't come forward in the next 30 days <laughs> with really good proposed changes, then we're not doing this again. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we'll do it again, but under the new rules, which will <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> with, with that ominous thought, um, all in favor of the motion as made and seconded, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? 
that matter carries. Uh, with that, that concludes item number six. Item number seven, approvals and resolution, notice of final licensure. Thank you, Chair. Item, item Agenda item 7A is an informational item presented as a notice to the board of establishments that have been issued their final license in the last since the last board meeting. Item number one is for Natural Medicine LLC, which was awarded a conditional medical dispensary license and a conditional adult use retail store license in the Las Vegas jurisdiction. On May 4th, the CCB conducted a pre-opening inspection and audit of the retail store located at 101 South Rainbow Boulevard. The inspection and audit results revealed the facility was in compliance with the NCCR and NRS. A statement of no deficiencies was issued on May 8th, demonstrating natural medicine has met the regulatory operational requirements to become operational. As a result, the CCB approved and issued the final licensure to natural medicine for its medical and adult use cannabis establishment on May 17th, 2023. Item number two is for Essence Tropicana LLC, which was awarded a conditional adult use retail store license in the Las Vegas jurisdiction. On May 2nd, 2023, the CCB conducted a pre-opening inspection and audit of the retail store facility located at 871 North Nellis Boulevard. The inspection and audit results revealed the facility was in compliance with the NCCR and NRS. A statement of no deficiencies was issued on May 4th demonstrating Essence Tropicana has met the regulatory operational requirements to become oper operational. As a result, the CCB approved and issued final licensure to Essence Tropicana for its adult use cannabis establishment on June 7th, 2023. Back to you, Chair. I'm sorry, I can't hear whoever's speaking. I still can't hear. I don't know if somebody doesn't have their microphone on. I didn't have the microphone on. Better. Thank you. That's all right. Uh, Chair Douglas, for the record, um, this ses legislative session, a sector of the cannabis industry came together with thoughts and proposals. That seemed to be a good first step for the industry. What we need to be totally effective is the industry to coalesce and bring all segments together at the table, whether it's pro or con, when legislation is proposed to get the best of what we are trying to do. This board can only be as good as the information it gets. So it's helpful to have dialogue, which we started last year and we'll work harder at it this year. Uh, and we're gonna be under new restraints as to making rules. But again, uh, we appreciate the comments because we can't make changes. We can't get any better if we don't know what's going on. And we are still, even though the industry has been around in another form, this legal industry with the various fights with the black market and other limitations. And as was talked about, the financial implications if you change one thing and don't change something else. We have to be awake the whole time. We can't wake up after things get passed. It puts us at a major disadvantage. Uh, that's just my random thoughts. I agree with those random thoughts. Chair Tyler Climbers for the record and um, we had a handful of bills passed and they were signed late last week by the governor. So now starts the implementation phase. We've got changes to fair market value, which I think is a positive step. We're going to be combining license types. We have changes to the discipl disciplinary process, civil penalties, time and effort, um, increase in purchase and possession limits. We have the CCP uh, going under the Administrative Procedures Act going forward. And then we have some governance changes as well. So we've got our hands full with that. Uh, board, you'll get further analysis on all these changes, what they mean for the board and also the industry. You're going to get some listservs, some policy guidance as we go forward as well. So expect that, um, expect potentially some this week as we implement uh, those changes and we'll likely need to collaborate on some of those for timelines. So we appreciate uh, your collaboration as we move forward with that. 
And to conclude, I just want to thank uh, each member of the Cannabis Compliance Board. The 85 full-time employees that we have, they work their tail off every single day. They do it for one reason, and that's to protect the public health and safety of this state. They do it sometimes, a lot of times, in the face of criticism, and they do it in the face of people who question their expertise and their experience. However, they show up to work every day and they get the job done. And the state is better for that. So I want to thank them for all the work that they do. Thanks, Chair. I'm sorry, if somebody's speaking, it's not on the record because I can't hear probably because adverse thoughts. Um, we have a plethora of items for future agendas based on just the new legislation. And we have carryovers as was presented, uh, looking at uh, regulations uh, that dealt with how we decipher what's in cannabis um, and looking at other things that are being done on the national level. Um, this is also the time for additional public comment. If we have any today, hey, you're free to come to the microphone, but please state your name first. Hello, my name is Berwin Tompkins. I represent I Got the Munchies Consumption Lounge. I have Victoria Williams with me as well, and Danielle Carell. Uh, we're here because we had a question regarding the 120 days suitability, suitability investigation. Um, if they weren't completed, does it go to the next group? Does it go back to the lottery as far as the people that let were not me, drawn in the lottery? With that question, let me direct you to staff who mm -hmm. can answer that question. I don't know, Mr. Staley, if you're the person that should do that or if someone else that's here can. Chair Douglas, uh, David Staley for the record. Um, you're requesting a response during public comment? Well, to have them go off to the side. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Thank you. He's the person just talked to and he'll point you in the right direction, okay. set up a follow-up to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, anyone else with general public comment? There we go. Mr. Douglas, board members, David Pope with the Attorney General's Office. and. I just wanted to introduce your newest senior deputy for the Cannabis Alliance Board, um, Tony Garassi. He's been in private practice for about 15 years and has a lot of um, um, civil practice experience and some board and commission experience. Did he draw the short straw? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's the lucky one. <laughs> um, and... Um, if uh, for any of you who haven't met Allison here, she started just a few months ago and I wasn't here to introduce her. So um, with that, thank you for your time. And uh, have she a has been with us and she's provided some valuable insight thus far. So we appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Other public comment in Las Vegas? Any public comment in Northern Nevada? No public comment in Northern Nevada. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna get out of here before 12 noon. Put that on your calendar. We're in recess, thank you very much. There may not be many. They may have taken care of what most of that was